Well, good morning. Come on, welcome to church. Let's stand on our feet.
would rocks cry out to worship whose glory taught the stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to see but this joy is mine with a thousand hearts church today amen I want to welcome you in my name is Willie and uh, it's our honor to have you here today if you're new to us we want to welcome you in 
and uh, there's a connection card at your seat. It says new here. If you scan that, follow the QR code, it will take you to all things lineage. And in addition to that, if you have any questions after service, you can come talk to us and our team at our Next Steps area. And we're just, we're just happy to be here. It's a week after Easter. We saw a lot of people come to Christ and what an honor it is to gather again for this first Sunday of the month. And in addition to that, we're gonna partake in communion together. And communion is a beautiful thing because we just pause and reflect. How, much, how many things are after our attention that, that are just distracting us, right? And then we have to actually be intentional and remind ourselves, hey, we have to pause and we have to look back before we can look forward, amen? So with that in mind, let's open up uh, the word of God to Matthew 26. Verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So as we are reflecting, because Jesus tells us in the scriptures to actually do this in remembrance of him. So as we reflect, and as we look back, we are reminded that we are not of our own, that we did, we weren't good enough. We, didn't, we couldn't pay the price of sin. We had a risen Savior who came and died. His body was broken. His blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So it's not something that we earn. It's not something that we boast about. It's actually grace that we receive. And as we ponder that, we're reminded that we're surrounded by a family. We're surrounded by people who love us and people who are at the table with us because Jesus left room for all of us to gather all of us who are tied together through faith, who are a part of one family, tied together through faith and belief in God. And we're reminded that we're not our own, that we don't sustain ourselves. We can't, there's not enough sustenance. There's not enough earthly things that can sustain us in an earthly, in a, in a spiritual way. So Jesus himself fills us up. Jesus himself, as we take those elements, as we break that, that element, and as we drink the element, we're reminded, Jesus, I'm yours. Use me. I, I, can't sustain myself on my own, and I'm ref I'm reflecting on that today. And I think what's beautiful about communion and Jesus is that, as merciful as He is, and as much as He has already done for our lives, He says that there's more. He says that they, He will be leading us in communion in heaven. So how great is it that we six, that we serve a Lord who gives more than we deserve? So as we think about that, as we ready our hearts, we are just thankful. For Jesus, we are thankful for the sacrifice. We're thankful for the cross. And we'll let you know that there are four stations across the auditorium. We're going to leave room and space as you and your family prepare. And you can turn this these steps into an altar if you wish. We want to let you know that there is room here to participate in communion together with your families. So at this time, you are free to participate. taking the elements, you can stand back on your feet. You give life, you love, you bring life to 
still have a purpose this morning. I'm going to praise the Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. We sing great. It's not all the 
screen. be magnified in our midst. Hey, go ahead and take just a few minutes to greet somebody to your left, to your right, front, back. to Easter at Lineage. We are so glad that you're here. We hope you've enjoyed your experience so far and believe that you will continue to be encouraged during the rest of our time together. On your seat today, there are a few cards. One is a white card with some check boxes on it. Pastor will lead you through this one at the end of service today. The other is a black card that says new here. If you scan that QR code on the back, you'll find more information about us and all the ways that you can connect to the Lineage family. Available after every service today are fresh, crispy cream donuts. So be sure to hang out. Hi, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's not donuts. So if, uh, if you're new to Lineage and um, this is your first time here, uh, that's a great first impression, all right? That's last week's news, all right? It's, it's not Easter, and it's not Groundhog's Day. None of that going on, all right? Hey, we're glad that you're here, and uh, let me just say this. My name's Ryan, and it's an honor to be the pastor here at Lineage. My wife, Amanda, and I have been serving here for 20 years, and we love uh, not only the Lineage family here at Coco, but all across our church. We're so grateful that we have a church in multiple places today. Um, our Lineage Melbourne campus is joining us, and uh, they are in the second week of meeting in their new facility, and so that's exciting. I want to say good morning to you if you're joining us from Melbourne. We're so gl glad that you're worshiping with us today, and uh, we're also excited that every week, dozens of households join us all across uh, this county, this beloved Space Coast, but also beyond that, from their homes, from their cars, wherever they're at, we welcome you to church as well today. So Coco West, can you just welcome the rest of your church family that's tuning in? We're glad you're here. Okay. So um, last week was Easter, and we had a great time celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, we presented to uh, not only you, but to all of our guests and our friends who are with us Obviously, the fact that uh, Easter and the resurrection of Christ is not something that we celebrate once a year. Uh, it's not even something we celebrate. It's really something that we live and experience, the resurrection of Jesus. And, um, and so last week, I just want to give you a little report. We had actually 650 people attend church in person last week. So praise God for that. Lots and lots of guests. 
Um, but also, uh, there were many joining online as well as usual. And um, we had 36 people put their faith in Jesus last Sunday. So can you praise God for that with me? From here to Melbourne, everywhere in between. And uh, we're excited that if you are one of those people taking your first steps with Jesus, um, I want you to know we've got a brand new series starting today called Fresh Life that really is for you. And I hope that it sharpens the faith of those of you who've been walking with God for some time. But if you're new to faith, I really want to take a few weeks to walk you through what, where you go from here. What, what is next? And so we're going to focus on that. Um, new faith in Jesus is a tremendous, tremendous thing. I think it's the most important decision you ever make where you're going to anchor your faith. And I do believe that it impacts the rest of your life, not just eternity. It impacts today. And we want to help you with today. We want you to know that God has a purpose and a plan for your life and that we hope you're seeing life already a week in with a new lens. And so we're going to dive into that today. I also want to say, you know, back to the donuts just because it's on my mind right now. Um, we had 648 donuts in the house last week and they were all gone. So <laughs> congratulations. That's a great sign of strength at Lineage Church. Um, that we can devour that many donuts. So anyway, lots of great numbers and things to think about. But I want to dive into this. Fresh life is what we're calling it and living in a renewed purpose. Um, what do we do? Where do we go? Um, here's my hope that today's message is actually a setup for next week. And what I mean for, by that is that it's a setup for you to actually take an active step in your faith in the next seven days that maybe you've never taken before and that's the step of baptism. And if you are a believer and you are a part of the lineage family and you say, Pastor, I've already been there, done that, you know, got the t-shirt even, okay? Been dunked, all right? Well, I want you to know this is a message, and I don't know how this sounds to you, but I'm just going to tell you, this is a message that I hope every follower of Jesus at Lineage Church could teach this message themselves, and I, I, I say it to you that way because to understand what God says about baptism and what we see modeled for us in the New Testament scriptures on baptism should be something that we aspire to not only do ourselves, but help lead others to it. We talk a whole lot about leading people to Jesus, which is paramount. But you know what? When you get someone to the point of the cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, it's only the first step. There are many others to take. We are followers of Jesus. We are, in fact, disciples of Jesus. And, and I want to kind of lean into that this morning and say, if you're a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, then you, you should aspire to know the steps. And the very first step that we take after putting our faith in Jesus is to actually participate in baptism. So I want to show you in the New Testament, um, Jesus, after resurrection, comes to his followers and actually presents himself risen from the grave. And, and he does that actually several times, appears to hundreds of people after his death. And he gives to us what's commonly called in, in Christianity and in scholarship, the Great Commission. The Great Commission, it's found in a few different places. I want to take you to Matthew, the book of Matthew, to show it to you there. In chapter 28, verse 19, he charges his followers with this. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples. Now, the therefore is important, all right? There's always lots of context to understand. The reason it says go, therefore, is because he's actually told them, now that I'm alive and and have risen from the grave, and I've conquered sin and death, and I've proven that to you, um, all authority has been put on me. All the authority in all the, it's all under my power, under my control. And I've proven that. And he says, because you know now that the Father's put that authority on me, I want you therefore to go do something. And that something is make disciples. And disciple, by the way, is just... If you want to know what the interpretation or the, the actual word is, it's student. It's someone who learns. And, and listen, have you ever signed up to learn something new? Anybody? Okay, I, I, 
uh, let me just go a little side note here for a second, okay? Do you mind? Is it all right? Okay, a little side note. I signed up to learn Spanish about four months ago, and I know about four words so far. I'm... Okay, but here's why. I, re- I, I have, her- my family heritage, we're from Spain, and we, lo- you know, my family kind of didn't continue on the, the language of, of uh, into further generations, so that was kind of lost, and I, I want to kind of regain some of that. But I notice how many people I'm with that I love and that I spend time with also are bilingual, and I'm like, I want to join the fun. I just, I want to be a part of this. And so when I started learning Spanish, I didn't want to learn it just so I could know it. I wanted to learn it so I could have conversations with people. And that's what a student is. They're not someone who learns for the sake of learning. They learn for the sake of doing and putting into practice. And I think that's so important to understand. And so, you know what I've figured out is is that even though I'm around people who know Spanish and I'm trying, like the conversations are few and far between, my goodness. And when you only know four words, that's just like... You know, you basically say hi and how are you and goodbye. And so, uh, but uh, pray for me. I'm going to keep working at it, okay? Here's the point. When you follow Jesus, you become a disciple of Jesus. You're a student not to just know some things, but to do some things. In fact, I think the Great Commission actually teaches that in a somewhat hidden way. It is an action-oriented charge. Go do something with your life and your faith. He says, make disciples. I want you to teach other people. And here's what that looks like. The focus I want to give for today's lesson is baptize. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on and he says, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And he makes a promise, I'll be with you forever. You won't be alone in it. And there's other aspects to this, but the point is this, go make disciples, teach people. And the way that you teach them how to follow me is you first baptize them. And I wanna make an emphasis out of that today. And I wanna talk to you about it. Now, before I actually kind of dive in, I I decided to, to teach baptism to you today by answering three really important questions that I think everybody would ask if they were new to faith, all right? But before I get there, I wanna just say, not everybody gets baptized, right? Some of you in this room would say, well, I'm a, I, I'm, I think I'm a believer in Jesus, but I've never, I've never been baptized. Or, or maybe you are new to faith, like I've said several times today, you, you, you've just put your faith in Jesus, and so you're ready to take that step. But sometimes people will go years as followers of Christ, Christians, and not be baptized. In fact, there's been a lot of that in my pastoral ministry where I've been able to baptize people who, they, yeah, I've been walking with God for 30 years, but I didn't, I, I didn't do this. And so why is it? So I want to start there and say, why, why, don't, why people don't get baptized? Why is it? Well, here's, let me give you just a few. There could be more. It's a failure to understand. That's why I want to teach it really plainly to you today, is that you understand why God has invited you and asked you to get baptized. It's important. You know, um, there is actually a lot of misunderstanding about baptism, what, what does it mean? Let me just frame it up for you this way. In a church that's non-denominational, and that's what lineage is, we're not a part of a, a mainline denomination. We have in our church a very wide spectrum of backgrounds, okay? We, if you could name denominations across this country, you would find that all of them are represented right here in our very own church. And let me tell you, each one has a little different nuance to what they teach on the subject of baptism. And so not only is there a failure to understand sometimes, but also there's misunderstanding between certain groups or people about what baptism actually means. So to kind of press into this a little bit, um, I have a confession to make, which is I like, I like comedy Um, And I particularly like movies that some people would say is a complete waste of time. Let me give you one. Nacho Libre. Has anybody ever heard of this movie? Okay. I brought it up a few times. It's a a powerful Christian film, and I think you should watch it, all right? But actually, Nacho Libre is about a monk 
And it is a comedy, okay? Nickelodeon produced the movie, all right? It's a, it's a comedy, and it's about a monk, and he wants to actually um, be a pro wrestler. It's quite an interesting, you know, it was, it was a very quiet pause right there. For, <laughs> and in his aspirations to do so, he actually brings this guy along who becomes his best friend. His name is Stephen. So it's Nacho and Stephen. And Nacho is concerned about Stephen's salvation, That's how he says it. I am concerned about your salvation. You have not been baptized. And so he kind of tricks him into baptism and kind of, you know, sneaks up on him, baptizes him in a bowl. It's a whole thing. You should check it out, all right? But but here's my point. is like baptism in that, that comedy scene is completely misunderstood. Like there's an association with baptism and salvation that is too strong of an overlap. And, and that actually happens in real life. That happens in serious situations where people begin to mix the two and they start to think, oh, if I don't get baptized, then I must not be going to heaven or I must not really be a Christian or I must not be saved at all. And so we got to clear some of this stuff up so that you understand what is God's responsibility according to his word and what is your responsibility according to his word. What does he do, but what does he ask you to do? Which kind of leads to the second thing, which is tradition, that people actually don't get baptized because there was some traditional step in the faith that they were raised in or the denomination they were in or the family that they were in, and it sufficed. And it was like, well, I don't need to go through baptism because when I was an infant, I was baptized or because, you know, in our house, we just don't do that or, or whatever it might be. Here's another reason people don't get baptized, pride. And that's not an insult to anybody who's maybe been dragging their feet. But let me, let me say it to you this way. Not pride in the sense of arrogance, but pride because if you choose to get baptized, especially here at Lineage Church, we are going to baptize you by immersion. There will be a baptistry full of water. You will go down in that, that baptistry in front of a crowd like this, and you will be dunked underneath and come out, and you'll have to walk out soaking wet. And some people just go, I'm not sure I would like to do that in front of everybody. And it takes a degree of humility to say, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this step. I mean, uh, every introvert in the wor- world thinks, I hope I don't have to get baptized, you know? I just don't want to be in front of the crowd, attention on me, and I just want to just encourage you with this today, okay? If, if, that's, if it's ever, if, if just being in front of people's ever kept you out of this step, I, I want to assure you of something. Um, the attention really isn't on you, and I hope to teach you that through God's Word today. It's actually on Him And it's an opportunity for a whole bunch of people to celebrate that a life has come up out of the grave. Sin has been paid for, and we get to put it on display. And here's here's another reason. There could be more, but here's here's the last one for now. Um, You have not yet believed in Jesus. And if you've not yet believed in Jesus, then you probably have never even been invited to take the step of baptism. Maybe never felt the desire to be baptized. And it might just be because your step is not baptism. It's actually to believe. What is salvation? It is God's grace received by faith. You know, I love what Ephesians chapter 2 says, and it's not on the screen, but Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says that you were saved by grace when you believed When you believe, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and his resurrection from the grave, salvation happens in your life. I'm anchoring myself to his work. He saved me. Now I take steps to display it, to honor him, and to be obedient to him. Not to save myself, but to show that I am saved. And so I want to talk to you just a, just a few more minutes about baptism, and I want to answer three questions, and here's what they are. Number one, what is baptism? Again, if you are brand new in your you're one of the 36. By the way, not just 36 people accepted Christ last year here at Lineage, or last week during our services, but 54 people have accepted Christ since January 1st of this year. And we have, yeah, you can praise God for that. You can praise God in Melbourne for that. You can praise God at home for that. Okay, listen, and I want you to know, eight people have been baptized the way that I'm going to teach it to you today, which means 
there's more of you who are ready for that step, okay? So what is baptism? Baptism in the scriptures is the Greek word in the New Testament, baptizo, and it is, see, I'm even learning some Greek, all right? So there you go. There can be multiple languages going on for Pastor Ryan. Okay, baptizo. I thought that'd be funnier. It just came to me. It wasn't. It's okay. We'll skip that at the 11. All right, so baptizo is to immerse. This is the biblical definition of what baptism is, and this is important. It means immersion by dunking underneath water, okay? So here's the deal. All other forms of baptism are actually not in the Scripture. Now, that's a big, that's a big statement to make because why? We're a non-denominational church. you got a lot of different backgrounds, and there is baptism in other ways in Scripture with water. Or I'm sorry, there are traditions that are different. But I would argue that they're not actually in the New Testament. Now, now, listen, does that make it wrong? Today is not debate school day. What I would tell you is whatever tradition you come from, you can easily tie those traditions back to a step to honor God or dedicate lives to the Lord. Let me give you an example. My, my dad, my grandparents, when my dad was born, took him to church, and they baptized him by, not immersion, but by sprinkling, because you don't do that to babies. You know what I mean? You don't just, hey, hold your breath, you know, okay? But they baptized him, and why did they do that? Because they wanted to honor God and dedicate their newborn son to the Lord. Years later, um, my dad learned that he was baptized that way. He didn't even know it. He didn't even remember it. You know, when it came to his attention, when he decided to get baptized this way, he was 16 years old and he had accepted Christ. He believed, like Ephesians 2, 8 says, he received God's grace when he believed. And they said to him, it's time for you to get baptized. And eight days after he believed, he got baptized. But my grandparents came to him and they said, hey, you've already been baptized. And he said, I have? And what we find out is my grandparents were dedicating his life, but there came a point where he decided to get baptized the way it is recorded and taught in the New Testament. So baptizo is to immerse. It's to immerse. And in the New Testament, there are 27 references where that word is used and represents thousands of people in those 27 times actually taking that step, okay? Now, here's the first thing I'd kind of unpack with what baptism is. Not only is it immersion underwater, but it is to illustrate renewal in Jesus. That's why. Why why underwater? Why would we go there? It's an illustration. How many of you have ever played Pictionary before? Anyone? Isn't it great? Especially for all you artists. I mean, non-artists. Non-artists, you know, it's awesome. Like, you get up there and you draw the picture out and everybody's got to guess, right? You got to come up with the illustration. Think about it this way. How many of you have things in your home that represent something indirectly or directly to a memory or a moment in life or something that you kind of hold dear, a value? Like a picture. Like, you, how many of you got a picture of your wedding day? Anybody? And you, and you frame it up and you hang it on the wall. And what's it do? It serves to remind you of something. And that's what baptism is. The immersion underwater is actually an illustration of Jesus dying and being buried in a grave. And that he did not stay there. He came out of that grave. So when I go into those waters, I'm just a living sacrifice putting on display that I have aligned my life to Jesus Christ. Let me show it to you in the scriptures. Colossians chapter 2 says, for we, for you, or we, were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life. Because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Okay, you got the picture? Immersion is an illustration. That's what baptism is. It's an illustration of what Jesus has done in defeating sin and death. And you're saying, I went into that grave and I died to self 
and I came out brand new. Is anybody grateful for that today? All right? Awesome. So it's the first thing, all right? Now, here's the second question. What is the purpose of baptism? What purpose does it hold? I understand it illustrates something, but what is that? What's the actual purpose of it? Well, I would tell you it was modeled by Jesus. I want you to know that. Jesus didn't just say baptize them. He actually got baptized himself. It's a really interesting moment in the life of Jesus, okay? Because what happens is he goes to John the Baptist, and John is actually baptizing people. Uh, spoiler alert, that's where, why he got the name he did, all right? He's baptizing people. Again, thought, boy, it's a, I don't know, if Melbourne, if you're laughing at that or not, but nobody here thought that was funny. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. He goes to John, and he has this dialogue, and he says, I need to get baptized. And John is like, no, 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 you need to baptize me. And Jesus is like, no, you need to baptize me. They have this argument, and they're standing on the on the banks of the Jordan River. And finally, he concedes and says, all right, I'll baptize you. Let me show it to you. It's it's actually recorded in Matthew 3. Um, John tried to deter him, and Jesus said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, check this phrase out, to fulfill all righteousness. Now, why is that so important? And John consented. Why is that so important? Jesus is the the perfect son of God. He is the lamb that we just sang about in that lyric. He is the spotless lamb, sinless son of God, possesses all the power of God, and yet he was fully human. And the reason this is important that he, he, he stated this is to let us know, it is a reminder to you and I, there wasn't a moment of his life that he was not seeking and fulfilling the will of the heavenly father. Why is that so important? Because if he did not, he would not have been eligible to be the sacrifice for sin. He was fulfilling all that God had asked him to fulfill. Even to the point where it confused John, I got to baptize you? You're God, yeah, but I am modeling for humanity what it looks like to live fully dependent upon the heavenly father. I am teaching my disciples in this moment. And so he fulfills that role. And I want you to know that's the purpose it it, it fulfills in your life. God has something for you in your baptism. God has a blessing for you in your baptism is the way I would like to say it to you. He has a blessing for you. And Jesus knew I'm not going to skip this and forfeit modeling this for those who would come after me. So here's, here's what I would define as the blessing. Check this out. It continues in verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. Now, God is about to speak, and you probably heard this before or read this before, but God's about to speak over Jesus audibly, like other people hear it. It's not like Jesus, hey, God told me when I was baptized, and and now I'm going to tell you. No, no, God speaks audibly, and he says, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and God says, with this voice from heaven, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. God actually says that twice in Scripture, the only time that you see the Heavenly Father speak audibly to Jesus in the New Testament, and he says the same thing. By the way, dad's really great template on how to love your kids right there. They're mine, I love them, and I'm really well pleased. Dads, that you want, you want to know how to parent? Moms, you want to know how to parent? There it is right there. But let me back up. He, it says in the text, heaven opened over his life, over him directly. When? After his baptism. I do believe this with all of my heart, that when you're baptized, heaven opens over your life in a unique way. God begins to fill your life with his presence in a special way. What special way? This way. That's my kid. And I love them. And with them, I am well pleased. You know why? Because you have traded your filthy rags for his righteousness. 
you have put your faith in the reality that you move from your self-righteousness, your unrighteousness, and you get to stand where he stands. And heaven sees you like heaven saw Jesus. Forgiven, whole, blameless, you are his. I'm telling you, we need more of that faith. We need more of that faith in, in the church. We need more of that faith in our cities. We need, we, there's a big lie that you still got some things that God is really frowning upon. No, when you have stepped into faith in Christ and you are following in obedience the steps he's marked out for you, this is the voice he speaks over your life. And here's the third thing, when. When should I do it? Um, well, Jesus instructs it, okay? And that's the point I want to make here is that Jesus instructs this as a part of your faith journey being the first step you take when you accept him as your savior. That's the instruction. So when you should do it immediately after you've put your faith in Christ. Uh, I would like to kind of unpack it this way for you and, and say, Maybe you've heard a phrase like this before in your life, that delayed obedience leads to disobedience. And, and what I would say to you is maybe you've put it in a category of delayed. Or maybe you're new to faith and you think, I don't know, do I really, should I jump into that right away? Should I take that step right away? I would just encourage you with this, that delayed obedience gives way to disobedience. And disobedience will not unsave you because it didn't stop him from coming and giving his life before you put your faith in him anyway. Your disobedience is not gonna unsave you or make you detestable to God. He's paid for your sins. However, I do think that disobedience circumvents a blessing on your life that you shouldn't forfeit. I, 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 I kind of walk my kids through this. That's the best way I can illustrate it is to say, <laughs> you ever had little kids in your home, maybe give them a few chores or things to do, and, and, or maybe mom does and say, hey, you, every day when you get up, I want you to make your bed. But I want you to do that before you do anything else. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, a few minutes go by and other things have taken place, but the bed is still not made. Has anybody had this experience before? Okay. Or how about with the trash? Hey, I need to take the trash out, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. When this is done, this is a very important YouTube video I need to watch right now. Well, no, I need you to take it now because it's full and we got other things to throw away and it's, you know, it's the whole thing. <laughs> Delayed obedience gives way to disobedience. And have you ever noticed that when you delay in being obedient in one thing, it actually, in many cases, never happens? Or it gets done another way by someone else. And I just encourage you, when do I take this step? Well, all through the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, there is a, there's a recording no less than 10 times in the book of Acts, people accepted Christ and immediately took the step of baptism. Now, let me just draw that back for you to the Great Commission. What did Jesus say? Therefore, go and make disciples. And what do you do? You baptize them. You know what they did? They told them about Jesus. They called them to repent. They called them to put their faith in Christ. And you know what they did immediately? All those apostles, they said, all right, we're, we, need to get to, we need some water. Anybody got some water? We're about to baptize some people. And it was the very first thing that they did. No less than 10 times. Let me show you the first time that happened in Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Peter's words, he's preaching a sermon, pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, he said this, each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized. We want you to put your faith in God through Jesus Christ that I just preached to you, and I want you to get baptized in his name and show that you have received forgiveness for your sins. And this is what happened. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 27 references of the word baptizo in the New Testament representing thousands of 
changed lives who took the simple step but yet profound step of displaying that they had been forgiven through baptism. So you do it right away. You know what we do here at Lineage is the second weekend of every month we have scheduled baptism. It's already scheduled. Like, there's no end date to it. It's just going to happen. Every second Sunday of the month, the baptistry will be cleaned, prepared, and ready to go. There'll be towels prepared. There'll be extra clothes. There'll be all the peripherals, and, and we will continue to say to you, hey, baptism's coming. That's a week from today, by the way. Next Sunday is the second Sunday, and we live in anticipation that people are going to accept the message of the gospel, and they're going to be ready to take that step. And you know what? Um, sometimes we get to a weekend, and we go, nobody Nobody said they wanted to be baptized, but we're ready. We're always ready. We always stand ready with the, I mean, the hose is there, man. It's there. It's like, just give me the cue. I'll turn it on, you know, because we anticipate that God is still working. God is still moving. God is still saving people from sin and death. He's still resurrecting lives, and so we're going to keep offering. We're going to still keep offering to you. Have you taken this step? Now, as we wind down today, I want to lead you an invitation, but before I do, I actually want to hand off the service there at Melbourne to our campus pastor, Pastor Randy, and uh, he's going to take the rest of the service from here. And I want to lead you in a prayer this morning. It's actually this right here, to accept the message Dozens of people in the last week have done this already. But I want to offer it to you again. Maybe you didn't pray this prayer. Maybe you have not put your faith in Jesus. I want to circle back to that and say, now's a perfect time to do it. To acknowledge, I need God's grace. I need it. I love what Willie said to us earlier in communion. I remember the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus through communion because it reminds me that I can't sustain myself. I need God's grace. I need his forgiveness. And man, do I need to understand and unlock for me the purpose for which he put me on this planet. And the scriptures say, turn from sin by turning to God. Accept it by faith. Not something we earn, something we receive. And so if that's you today, we'd just love to lead you in prayer. So would you bow with me? In fact, as we bow, would you just stand to your feet this morning and uh, bow your heads and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. I pray that you'd just sharpen the faith in the room today and help us to press in and maybe be reminded of some things that we already knew about baptism and why we do it, but, but maybe it's brand new and fresh for others and it's helping them grow and build the right foundation. We just thank you for being a God who is personable, God who's close. You're not ambiguous. You're not undefined. You're not a theoretical God. You're a God who's come to this earth, put on a human body, and you've shown us who you are. Thank you, Jesus, giving us the picture of who you are. A God of compassion, a God of justice, and a God of forgiveness. If today you're ready to receive God's grace, then I want to lead you in this prayer. You can just turn it into your own words, but you say, Pastor, I'm ready for that. I need God in my life. In fact, if that's you, would you just hold your hand up for a moment in the room or online? You can acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I just pray with me, Pastor. Lead me in that. If that's you and you've raised your hand, you can just pray these words. Make it your own. Say, Heavenly Father, I receive your grace today. Thank you for Jesus who gave his life on a cross and also came out of a grave and offers forgiveness. I need it today. I ask you to forgive me, heal me, and lead me. And then tell him this, say, would you be the Lord of my life? Would you be the one in charge? 
And I think if you'll ask him this, he'll, he'll meet you right where you are. You ask him this. You say, will you teach me how to walk with you step by step from this day forward? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, come on. Can we thank God for his salvation? Isn't that awesome? Love you, church. God bless you. Amen, amen. What a great day it's been, church. And kind of to piggyback off what Pastor Ryan says, what's, what's that next thing that you need to do in your walk with Christ? And some of us, is, it is baptism. Some of us need to be water baptized. And we're here to help you with that step. We're going to be baptizing people next Sunday. So sign up at Next Steps. Talk to someone. If you have questions, if you want to actually explore what that means, maybe you don't fully understand, we can help explain that to you um, as you walk this faith out in Christ. Because really, um, taking the next spec best step is the best thing to do. It's not, well, let's look at this long 30-year plan. No, what's the next the next thing that God has in front of you? What's the next door that he wants you to walk through? That's where you need to think, and that's where you need to be. So think about that. Pray about that, and talk to somebody. Talk to our team member. Talk to our prayer team. We'll be here in the front. If you have a prayer need, we want to pray with you. We just want to let you know that you are supported, that there are resources for you beyond this moment. Um, and uh, church, I want to tell you, thank you for being generous. We are a generous people at Lineage. Um, we believe in returning to God. Our tithes and offerings, three ways to give, are on the screen. So if you feel led to give, uh, we can do that online or in person. Uh, so we just live generously. We just change lives through our generosity throughout the world, through the Space Coast. We let just God use us in a special way. So as we prepare to leave and, and uh, head out into our day, let's pray uh, to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you uh, for this congregation, uh, for this household of faith, Lord. And we just ask for protection, for blessings, Lord, uh, over these individuals and his families, God, as we step into our day, Lord. We love you, and we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen.
Stages, you love me even in the changes. One day I'm trying to replace us. Next day I won't let go. <laughs>